Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'm so glad to see all of you here today. I know we're missing a few because the Labor Day weekend, you know, it's a holiday weekend. Lots of people like to take off. But we're going to be starting our worship in song today, and we're going to be singing, Brethren, we have met to worship. Would you stand with me and sing? It's number 379. We're going to be doing verses 1 and 4. So let's pray together. Father, what a privilege it is, first of all, to call upon you as our Father. We come not on our own merit, but through the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who has gone before us, who has accomplished for us at the cross our salvation and redemption, and given us a hope for greater things yet to come, the promise of everlasting life for all those who are in Christ, who have turned from sin and trusted in your saving work on the cross and the power of your resurrection victory. God, you have opened up to us the access way, the, the entry point by which we can approach your throne of grace and call upon your name, knowing that you hear our prayers and that you respond to the prayers of your people. God, what a privilege it is. I pray that we will not make light of it or take prayer for granted, but make more use of prayer and trust you more and look to you more for the help and strength and provision that we need in life, for the guidance and direction. Oh, God, we, we thank you for prayer. Thank you for hearing us when we call to you. And Lord, I pray today that as we have gathered and met for worship, Lord, that you would meet us here in this place with an overwhelming sense of your presence, your Holy Spirit dwelling richly within us through faith, that your word would speak clearly to our hearts and minds, that you would clear out the clutter, whatever might hinder us from listening to your voice today. Lord, remove it from our minds that we might not be distracted, but that your word can take root within our hearts and that we will live out the word that you give to us today. God, we pray this for the strength and encouragement of your church. We pray it for a witness into this world that is so desperately needing to find salvation and peace and joy and hope. Lord, ultimately, we pray it so that you will be glorified. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So again, welcome today. It's always good to be with you and glad to have you here. I'm glad uh, for Steve making some breakfast for the kids this morning, and not just kids, but others. But hey, how, how was that this morning? Was that pretty decent? Amazing. Yeah. I tell you what, when Steve makes breakfast, he does, he does all right with it. <laughs> 
Now, it may not be that way every time. Now, next week, if you come and it's like, uh, well, I think Amy's doing it next week, right? I was going <laughs> to... No, you come next week. It'll be awesome. <laughs> you, thought, you thought this week's breakfast was good. Just you wait until you see what Amy's got in store for you next week. So. All right. <laughs> Hey, I want to say a word of thanks to uh, everybody who had a part in helping deliver the daily bread meals uh, this past month. I know it's a lot of work and a, a lot of time invested, but um, if my math is correct, this is just a ballpark figure, but uh, I'm, I am sure that we've delivered over 800 meals over the past month uh, to those who are homebound. And so I just want to say a word of appreciation to everybody who helped in any way. Yeah, thank you all. Thank you. For doing that, a great ministry, uh, much appreciated, much needed, and uh, all, always grateful for the opportunity to do so. Uh, a couple things that I want you to know about, uh, you'll see some of these in your bulletin, but uh, today at 1.30, I will be out at Sunny Acres Nursing Home. We'll share in just uh, ministry time out there, share a devotional type of message, we'll sing a bunch of songs and uh, pray together with the residents. So if you are available and want to come out at 1.30 today out there, I uh, would love to welcome you and invite you to be there and uh, be a part of that service today. Uh, if you do want to help with the kids' breakfast coming up in future weeks, there's a, a sign-up sheet on the bulletin board, and you're welcome to participate in that. And no, you don't have to fix a big meal. It, it can be something really simple. Listen, even if you just want to go out and buy some uh, you know, pastries or Pop-Tart, cereal kind of thing, that is more than acceptable, and you can be a part of that. So uh, see some of the um, opportunities to do that if you're interested. Also, with our Harvest Fest uh, water bottle ministry coming up, we would welcome donations of water, as you can see some of those starting to gather out there, as well as coolers. If you are not uh, planning to use a cooler that weekend that you have and you want to uh, let the church borrow that for that event, we would... Be glad to, uh, to receive that. Um, other things in your bulletin? I listed there for you to read. But if anybody wants to make a special mention of anything else coming up, you got a minute to do that. Yeah, one more week. To, um, I still have the sign-up sheet up for the ladies' Bible study that's coming up. Um, it's going to start next Sunday night, okay? And I believe I still have one book available. I can always order more. Because I have an extra book from the IPSA, too, so that I can use in the meantime while um, we're waiting for one to get in. So um, if you would like to join us, please um, talk to me today or sign up on the bulletin board so we know. Thank you. All right. Very good. Anybody else? I've got a pretty good sign up going on the Joy Fish Fry, which is a week from tomorrow. Um, as I look out, I see most of the journal might come signed up, but if you're not signed up and you'd like to come, I'd kind of like to have your name or say something to me afterwards just so we know for sure how many we're planning on having. Make sure there's enough that I can tell Tom to make sure he has enough fish for that many. So 11.30, a week from tomorrow, the fish fry. Here? Sounds Here. good. In the basement. If your name, I left the list out there so you can double check if, if you're, some of you signed up last month. If you're like me, it's not good. I try to not sign up. You can check to see if the name's on there, or if you sign up again, I'll cancel out the double entry. I'd like to know if you're coming. So. Sounds good. Sounds real good. I mean, the fish fry is always really good. I, I believe Tom's out fishing this morning with that, just to give us a few extra time. Well, and just a reminder that is the just older youth at age 60 and older. And your guests. Good, good. Anybody else? Bryce, you had your hand up. It's good to have you here this morning. And your brother, too. You brought your brother with you. Very good. Always glad to have you guys here. All right. Well, we're going to sing a couple more songs. And then uh, we also, this morning, you can tell, are preparing our hearts for the Lord's Supper service. And uh, encourage you to let the Lord do, even as we sing these songs, a little bit of work uh, as we examine ourselves and uh, seek to get into a right relationship with the Lord through prayer, confession, and trust in Him. So, Amy, go ahead and come.
If you want to use your hymnal, this is hymn number 136, and we're going to be singing verses 1, 2, and 4. Are you watching the one we sing?
But we indeed have been ransomed, rescued from our sins, saved with the desire to grow in Christ and to become holy like him. Saved to sin no more. Oh, that that, that were true, practically speaking, in our lives. Amen. I hope that is your Amen. prayer. I want to read. Uh, you guys can go ahead and come forward if you want to here. Whoever is uh, serving at the table this morning. But uh, I'm going to be reading from 1 Peter uh, chapter 1. Uh, Verses 13 through 21, just to let the word of the Lord soak in to our hearts, reminding us of why we are coming to the table, reminding us that Christ has given his life for ours, and we celebrate in honor of him, remembering his body, represented by the bread broken for us, his blood, represented by the cup, shed for the forgiveness of our sins. And here's what Peter writes to the church. Therefore... Preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on him as father, who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. And we proclaim that message today by celebrating, taking part in the Lord's Supper. I'm going to ask Greg, Stacy, if you don't mind, take a moment to lead us in a word of prayer before we leave. Father God, we come before you and are reminded that we have the hope of eternity with you through Jesus Christ. It's not an instant improvement in us. It's a process for us. But, Lord, we don't strive to reach some standard to to be able to be with you. Once we accept Jesus, we have assurance that we will be with you because it is through Jesus and who he is, not through where we are in, in personal gain or growth. So, Lord, our only hope is through the blood of Jesus, and you make it clear to us that that is available to all, and that all we need to do is accept your love sacrifice of Jesus, and we can claim eternal life with you. So Lord, work in our hearts and our minds and in our actions and help us bring honor and glory to you, Father. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 And you are welcome to participate uh, with the elements uh, this morning. If you are a believer in Christ, this is a, uh, you don't have to be a member of this particular church, but you do need to be a member of the family of God through faith and trust in Jesus, the Savior and Lord of your life.
writing to the church, saying, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance. the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Sing with me, oh, how he loves you in me.
He loves you. You know that, don't you? Amen. Brings hope from despair. Maybe somebody in here today is feeling uh, like they're in a state of despair, hopeless perhaps, uh, frustrated. We kind of talked about this in our Sunday school class today. Maybe you feel like uh, life is nothing more than you're trying to chase after the wind, but uh, finding out that you can't, you can't even get a handful, you can't grasp that. Uh, it's become meaningless, pointless. You're wondering what you're here for, what uh, everything is all about. I'm not telling you that uh, this is what Jesus came to do. He brings hope from despair. He gives meaning and purpose in life when we seem to wonder what in the world is it all about. What he did at Calvary proves the depth of God's love for you. Maybe you're feeling all alone, unloved, unwelcome, unwanted. But I'm telling you today that God loves you so much that even while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He did it for your salvation so that your sins can be forgiven, wiped off the books, blotted out, cleansed, that you can be made new today. In Christ Jesus. You can have a new life. Maybe you didn't like the old one. Maybe you don't like the one you've got. But you can be made new in Jesus today. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. It is gone. Behold, the new has come. And this is the life that he offers freely to you. It is a gift. You can't earn it. You don't deserve it. But he wants to give it to you. His arms of mercy and grace are wide open, beckoning you to come to him. Find rest for your soul. Find hope instead of the despair. And find that in Christ there is life, and it is full, and it is everlasting. That's what he offers to you today. Praise God for the gift of eternal life, salvation in Christ Jesus our Lord. This Labor Day weekend, we are coming together uh, not just here, but uh, celebrating as a nation, the American worker in various ways and forms, the workforce, those whose work and labor has helped build this nation into uh, the great nation that it is and has been, uh, strength and prosperity on the backbone of people just like you and me, people who are out there working hard for a living. Uh, I almost started singing work at 9 to 5 in our Sunday school class today, but Amy grabbed my arm and said, so we won't sing work at 9 to 5 today, but uh, either way, this weekend uh, is a good weekend to honor and uh, celebrate and remember, and even if you get a chance, to rest a day from your labors tomorrow. Not everybody. How many people are working on Labor Day tomorrow? Yeah, you got a, got a few in here that have to. Actually, I just saw one hand, Carolyn. I guess you're the only one. Do you know we're going to work on Labor Day? Well, I don't know. You see, a lot of farmers have gone this weekend, too, so I don't know what they're doing, but um, does the mayor have to work on Labor Day? Where's, where, he's out doing some security. He gets a phone call, yeah. Yeah, he's on call anyway, right? So. Well, I want to, uh, for us, to take a moment to appreciate those who have labored uh, to help build this nation in various ways. Uh, the, I, think, I think it's good that we do that, to honor those but I think it's also, spiritually speaking for us today, a good opportunity to remember that we are called to labor in the Lord. God has work for us to do. It's not just that we get saved and then say, all right, good, I got that taken care of, I'm done, I don't have to do anything else. Listen, that's just the beginning, right? That's the beginning of a new job that you have been given. Your job is to be a witness for the Lord, an ambassador for Christ Jesus. You are a laborer in the kingdom of God, going out into his vineyards, his harvest fields, doing the work that he has called you, us collectively, to do. And let me tell you this as well. Some of you have been laboring in those fields for a really long time. You've given your heart, you've invested your soul, blood, sweat, and tears for the sake of the kingdom of God. And maybe you're today at a point where you're wondering, but what do I have to show for? not leading a lot of people to the Lord. I'm not sure that people are being discipled by my influence. And, and you, you might even be wondering if it's been worth it. Well, let me assure you from the Word of God today again that your labor in the Lord is never in vain. God sees what you do. He knows your faithful 
this. He sees the things that nobody else knows anything about. He sees your generosity. He sees your acts of kindness and service for his name. He sees it all, and there is a great reward for those who remain faithful in service to God, even if those rewards don't pile up in crowns on this side of eternity, the things done under the sun. God knows and rewards those prayers that nobody else hears you pray. When you're in your closet, pouring your heart out before the Lord, interceding for others, wondering if answers will ever come, God knows every prayer. He hears them all, and in his way, in his time, for his purposes, he will bring about his perfect will. Don't give up. Don't grow weary. Don't think that it's for nothing. God knows, and your labor today is not in vain. But it also reminds us that there is still work to be done. There's a lot of work that's still to be done. Our calling in Christ uh, calling to pray this morning specifically, we're, we're going to look at that, the call for us to pray and the call for us to proclaim the good news of salvation in Jesus. We see this in 1 Timothy chapter 2. If you have your Bible, I'm going to read the first seven verses for our time together this morning. First of all, then, Paul writes to Timothy, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for who? All people. For kings and all who are in high positions. Why? So that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good. And it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires what? All people to be saved. That is the heartbeat of God for the souls of men and women on every continent throughout the entire world. World. He wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and man, men, the man, Christ Jesus, who did what? He gave himself as a ransom for who? All people. Are you hearing the word all in there? I hope so. Who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. And Paul says, for this I was appointed... A preacher and an apostle. I'm telling the truth. I am not lying. A teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. So, Father, please help us to hear what you have to say today. Let these words soak into our hearts, our minds, so that we know more about what you want us to do. Lord, reveal yourself and your desire for the salvation of the nations so that we can better align our hearts and our minds and our lives with your work that you have given us to do in this world for your glory. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So just very quickly, a, a review of where we have been in the first chapter of Timothy so far. We're talking about the entire letter being summarized kind of in these terms. Paul's telling Timothy, keep holding to the true gospel that accords with godliness. Now, he's saying that because there are some who are teaching false things, leading people away, even making shipwreck of their faith. So he starts out by saying, so I'm telling you this in love, that the whole purpose behind what I'm saying and what I'm charging you to do, it's with the heart of love, but you've got to stop the wolves from infiltrating the flock and destroying them. You've got to put a stop to the false teachings that are happening within the church. Listen, this is the church that Christ himself has purchased with his own blood. We need to protect it as holy. We need to keep the church pure. We need to keep the church focused on the, the one who gave his life for us and do what he has called us to do. It's not just about doing whatever we think the church ought to be about in our world today. No, he's given us the instructions. He's given us the mission. He's given us the truth and the wisdom to do it. So we need to stay true and faithful to God. And so Paul understands that that has, is the work that has been entrusted to him. It's the gospel of the glory of the blessed God that has been entrusted to Paul. And he, with his apostolic authority, delegates that to Timothy, saying you need to handle this situation. 
And Paul goes on here to say in this chapter, as we looked at last week, hey, if you're, if you're looking for mercy, look no further than me. Listen, I, I was one who was so far away from God. I was a, a violent opponent. I hated the church. I hated Jesus. I hated everybody that wanted anything to do with Jesus. But God had mercy on my soul. In fact, his grace and love overflowed for me with faith in Christ Jesus. And he says, hey, I'm, I'm an example of God's perfect patience to anyone. If you think you're so far gone that God can't save you, think again. If he did it for me, he can do it for you. And he longs to do that. So, Timothy, stay faithful to your calling. Fight to stay faithful to it. This is your charge. I'm commanding you to do this. Hold firmly in the faith. So then we get into chapter 2, and uh, he's going to start by saying, so the most important thing that you need to do first is to pray. How many of you feel like you kind of wish prayer was your go-to, but sometimes prayer is more like an afterthought? Than the go to. Does that ever happen to anybody else? Like, you know, we do all our best to try to figure things out on our own. We, you know, experience all the hardships of the situation, and it gets sometimes so bad that we think, well, maybe we ought to pray about this. <laughs> well, Paul's saying, first of all, your first instinct ought to be to go to the Lord in prayer. You know, I'm, I'm working on that myself. Um, but here's what Paul is saying let's pray. All kinds of prayers for all kinds of people, because we'd all be in all kinds of trouble if God doesn't pour all kinds of grace out upon us, since we are prone to doing all kinds of foolish things. Pray first. Pray often. Pray always. Pray without ceasing. The most important thing is to pray. And don't quit praying. Make it your priority to pray. What do you think God would do in our world if we spent a lot more time praying. I think it was Billy Graham that said something like this. Heaven is full of answers for which nobody ever bothered to pray. You know, I, think, I like the picture of that. That God is willing to pour out answers <coughs> to the prayers of his people if we would but <coughs> pray, ask. Right? And isn't it an open door invitation? To pray, ask, <coughs> seek, knock, and to persevere in that. So don't quit praying. Samuel Chadwick, the old-time theologian, said it this way, the one concern of the devil is to keep Christians from praying. He fears nothing from prayerless studies, prayerless work, or prayerless activity. He laughs at our toil mocks our wisdom, but trembles when we pray. Satan knows that there is power in prayer. Do we know that? Maybe we don't have because we don't ask, James says. So we need to pray. Let's pray all kinds of prayers for all kinds of people. That's what he's saying. I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people. And it really doesn't do us a lot of good to you know, worry or spend too much time on the Lord. What does he mean by supplication? And what's the difference between supplication and prayers and intercessions? The idea behind this is just with a broad scope of ways that we need to pray for the people, we need to do that. And even praying with thanksgiving. So we want to do that. Praying for all people. So there's an emphasis in all of that. But then he also emphasizes not just praying for all people in all kinds of ways, but specifically, verse 2, for kings and all who are in high positions. Now, that's really an important uh, point of this passage, too, that we want to take a moment uh, to, to focus on. If you remember, if you know history well enough, who was in charge, like the big <coughs> dude in charge at the time that Paul wrote this letter to Timothy? Anybody know? Nero. Nero. Nero was the big dude in charge of the Roman Empire at this time. Was Nero a nice guy or a nasty guy? Nasty. Ooh, everybody go, yes. No, I'm just going to do that. <laughs> Nero, he was cruel. He was oppressive. Nero is the one who, uh, you might remember, just from reading some history, in AD 64, the city of Rome burned, and 
Nero needed a scapegoat to blame somebody for this fire that consumed much of the city. And who did he blame? The Christians. The Christians. And that started ratcheting up all kinds of incredibly severe, intense persecution against Christians in not just in the city of Rome, but throughout the entire Roman Empire. And uh, led to some, you've heard stories and read, I'm sure, about uh, some being butchered, fed to the lions, uh, like different things. And he just, uh, his cruelty knew no bounds. This was the Nero in charge that Paul likely would have had in mind when he said, so when you're praying, make sure that you pray for kings and all who are in high positions. So not just if they're nice and kind and, you know, benefactors to the Christian faith, but even when they're not, maybe especially when they're not. That ought to drive us even more to our knees in prayer for those who are antagonistic and even hostile to the message of the gospel. And didn't Jesus say something like this in the Sermon on the Mount? Love your enemies and do what? Pray for those who persecute you. Listen, anybody can be nice and kind to those who are nice and kind back to you. But it's a supernatural, spiritual level of a follower of Christ who even prays for those who are persecuted. Even Jesus showed the example of that, hanging on a cross, praying for the forgiveness of those who are mocking and insulting him, spitting on his face. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. You think we could turn some things around in this world if that was the desire of our hearts? If we were praying earnestly, even for those who dislike us. And I don't see anywhere in here, and I'm, I'm looking hard, but I'm not finding where it says, and if they're not nice to you, then you need to complain about them, and you need to grumble, and you need and you need to go on social media and rant and rave about how bad all these leaders are. I just, I haven't found that yet. It does say pray, and we need to do a much better job of that. We need to pray. You know, it doesn't mean we just sit by idly and watch, you know, Rome burn. But we need to go to prayer first and foremost. And why? Well, what's the point? Verse 2. Why does he say, make sure you're praying all kinds of prayers, even for kings, and those in high positions, that is, those in authority, various governing leadership, and, and you could add uh, others who have significant influence. Here's the purpose. So that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. So what's he saying? The purpose of that is, is so that believers, the church, can continue with the work that God has given us to do. And do it without, uh, without fear. Now, it's not like God doesn't use periods of persecution to shape the church and to even let the gospel flourish under those conditions. But that's not what the ideal would be. The ideal would be that we would live in an environment where we can teach the gospel, preach the gospel, disciple one another, live in, a, in an atmosphere that reflects God's goodness for what he desires, communities and nations to look like. Listen, God's desire, even for Israel, back in the Old Testament days, is that they would experience the great abundant blessings that he had in store for them. And as far as they lived in faithfulness to his word, obedience to his commands, they experienced his hand of great fruitfulness and generosity and peace and prosperity and protection from their enemies around them. But when they started turning to their own ways and left God out of the equation, started serving other gods and rebelling against the ways of the Lord, they started experiencing his disciplining judgment against them. And things didn't go so well. The point of all that is that let's, let's pray for, for, good, uh, for a good environment in which the gospel can flourish, where we can live out our faith in quietness and godliness and in dignity. Godliness here meaning true reverence and religious devotion that leads to a life that reflects the gospel that we profess. Dignity uh, has, carries kind of a weight of a serious purpose and a moral uh, 
um, earnestness about our lives, you're going to see both of these terms used throughout this letter. Uh, in fact, uh, the idea of godliness is, is uh, echoed throughout. The idea of dignity comes in a couple times, and we're going to see in chapter 3 in particular, uh, related to the office of overseer or pastor, as well as the office of deacons and deacons' wives, who must be dignified in their conduct. So that's what God's desire is, so that we can live out our faith in all seriousness, earnestness, truthfulness, sincerity, in a way that, uh, what do you want to say, just influences our entire culture for godliness. That's the purpose behind praying, all these kind of prayers, even for kings and those in positions of authority. But it does not mean, just to clarify this, Paul is not saying that... Uh, by leading a peaceful and quiet life, that we ought to just keep our faith private and not take it out into the public square. Just, you know, you got your faith, that's fine. Just don't tell anybody about it. Just live it out in the privacy of your home. That's, that's absolutely not what he's saying. He's uh, talking about the, just living it out in a way that does influence the entirety of the culture. More specifically, so that others will be brought to salvation. So that's what we're going to see in this next section. Now, um, let's take a pause here for a moment and say, you know, Paul could only dream about ministering and preaching the gospel in a culture like ours in the United States of America, where he's not constantly being threatened. People aren't picking up stones to throw at him every time he starts preaching the gospel, where they're not seeking to put him in prison and not threaten him with even death. We, let's just pause in a moment of thanksgiving as part of our prayers to say, Lord, thank you for the environment in which we are able to live today. We have freedom to come together like this on a Sunday morning and gather any time during the week. You can meet at parties. You can meet down at the coffee shop, Erico. Uh, we, we have the freedom that's unprecedented. Paul would have never imagined having been able to do the kinds of things that we are doing. And yet, compared to the way Paul pressed on in the midst of the hardships versus the way that we worry about offending this person or that person or everybody else, man, he puts us to shame. What are we doing, in other words, with the freedoms and the gifts and the grace that God has given us here in this land? I think that's a good question for us to ask. Let me very quickly give you seven prayer points. When you want to think about praying for kings and those who are in high positions, pray for our president. Pray for the governing authorities. Pray even for our uh, mayor of Petersburg, Illinois. Does, does Rick need prayer? Oh, yeah. Hey, answer is in the affirmative. That's a yes. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I, I would uh, say that's in that role. I meant in that role. <laughs> yes. Don't want to be misconstrued here. <laughs> we, you know, we're not for no reason called to pray for those who are in those kinds of positions. So let's pray for Rick. Let's pray for our government leaders. Governor Prince, pray for President Biden. Let's pray for the presidential candidates that are out there who will take on that position next. But um, sometimes we struggle. Like, I don't even know what to pray. How should I pray for people? And sometimes, especially when we you know, disagree with their decisions, with their positions, their policies, you know, how do, how do we turn those things into prayers? Well, I'm going to give you seven very quick points that you can take home and look at, think about how you can pray this way. And this, this is not exhaustive, just a few. Number one, pray for their salvation. Let, let's just make it a habit of our, of our lives to pray for the salvation of souls, for all people, but especially for those who are called into positions of leadership and Governing authority. Number two, I don't have time to unpack all these deeply, but uh, we'll just go through quickly. Pray that they'll seek to honor God in their personal character and time. Number three, pray for godly wisdom to guide their thoughts and decisions. You want me to write these down? Do I need to go slower? Maybe I can post these on our Facebook page as well. Number four, Pray for their courage to do the right thing. Pray for their 
willingness to stand, because they're, they're going to face opposition. We know this. It, it takes courage. If you're seeking after the Lord to do what's right, to do what's true, to do what's just, you're going to face people who will balk against that, who will fight back against that. It's going to be hard. It takes the courage of a strong leader who has faith in the Lord. Listen, doing the right thing is always the right thing to do. Even if they're not, you know, totally sold out believers for Christ, leaders still need to do what's right. We need to pray that they'll have courage to do things that are right and true and just. All right? Next one. Pray for those who advise them that they will influence them for good and not evil. Every leader has people speaking into their lives. They have cabinet members. They have uh, others who have an opportunity to give them advice, counsel. Um, but we need to pray that that counsel will be good and God. That it will lead them in the right way that they should go. That they will not be influenced by the evil voices around them. Uh, what do we got? Number six? Pray against... This is okay, too. Pray against them. Not only are we praying for them, but we are praying against evil, corruption, lies, greed, divisions, abuse of power, all kinds of things that get into the heads of people who arrive at a position and a status and think that they're all that, and they start elevating themselves. <coughs> let's pray that, again. Let's pray against the things that would lead them to do stupid, ungodly things that end up destroying and dividing cities and states and nations. We can pray against the demonic influences. Satan would love nothing more than to create chaos and division, so discord and deceive people and mass numbers. We, we can pray against those things. And number seven, let's, because, because we are in the governing system of the United States where we do have a voice. You know, Paul in his day did not have a vote on whether Nero got to serve another term or not. Um, Jesus in his day did not have an opportunity to vote anybody out of office. We have been given a gift. We the people are the governing authority in a sense in the United States of America. We have the power to say these are the kinds of people we want to lead us, that we would like to see in office. This is the kind of direction that we want to go as a people who want to honor the Lord. And so let's pray that we as a people will seek to elect God-fearing leaders who will want to serve, strive to serve with godliness, with wisdom, with strength, with humility, with dignity, all of these things that ultimately will make us into a virtuous and prosperous nation. Let's pray that we the people will honor and respect those whom God has placed in positions of governing authority. We are called to that. We are called to honor those leaders that God has ordained, whether you like them or not. And by the way, God is still in control. Amen. It does not matter ultimately who's in the White House. I mean, it does matter on a temporal level. Yes, but God is still in control. Jesus Christ is still the king of kings. And he can set up a ruler for a time, but he can also remove rulers as he sees fit. He can raise up kingdoms, and he can bring down kingdoms. And we have seen him do this throughout history. Christ is in control. It's helpful for us to remember that. And I... So I'm sorry to say that your Sunday school teacher is not on the ballot this November. You know, I I, I don't know. Should we maybe uh, start a grassroots campaign to elect Rick as the president? No. Can we do that with the write-in? No. I mean, you don't want to be the first lady of the United States of America. We would, we would commission you guys as a couple, and we would send you off with blessing to Washington, D.C., representing the church, representing the interests of Jesus. Man, I think, I think we ought to, Penny. Okay. Have you prayed about that? No, I have not. <laughs> <laughs> well, this election cycle, you don't have a Sunday school teacher on the ballot. 
so we need to pray with great wisdom, with great discernment, not just what candidate we want to see in the White House, but what direction, because you're seeing two visions, you know, for what this country is going to be about, and uh, which direction do you want to go? That's the question. So let's just pray. Let's pray that God will guide us in all of those ways. But here's another point that I want to pray, that I want to bring to your attention. Let's pray that, uh, that this will also be true, that we as a church don't expect the government to do what the church ought to be doing in the first place. Uh, it was Chuck Colson, I think, who said, it was him, and I think he said something like this, don't expect the Savior to come riding in or flying in on Air Force One. If you're looking for a president to be the Savior, then you're, you're already you know, distorted in, in the way that you're thinking about it. Uh, the president is not the Savior of the church. The president is not going to lead us to the throne of God's grace, that's, that's the church's job. So let's pray for a spirit of repentance and revival in the church. The church needs to do the job the church is called to do. We are the salt. We are the light of the world. And when the church is doing what it's supposed to do, then the gospel can flourish. Hopefully the gospel will flourish. And we are seeing more and more people come to know the Lord, to more and more people wanting to live a righteous and holy life, and by virtue of being the elected representatives in Congress, in the White House, wherever, we will see more and more of our elected officials leading as representatives of the people. But the Savior is not going to come flying in on Air Force One. We need to remember what Second Chronicles 7.14 says. We're in a different context, uh, yes, but the principle still applies, where God says... This to Solomon, if my people who are called by my name do what? Number one, humble themselves. That would be a good starting point. And pray, that's what we're talking about, and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. He's talking to his people. He's talking to the church. That's us. That's on us. Let us lead the way with humility, prayers, seeking the face of God repenting from our sin. Then what does God say he will do? He will hear from heaven, he will forgive our sins, and he will heal their land. I don't know about you, but we, I, I think I need to re reignite the fire within my own heart to see that happen. Let the church be the catalyst. Let the church be the spark that ignites a whole flame, even a wildfire throughout this nation with a return to godliness. And let's pray for God's will to be done. Namely, the salvation of souls. This is good, verse 3, Paul says. And it's pleasing the sight of God, our Savior, who has a heart full of desire for all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. Now, these are not two different things. To be saved and to come. It's just one, one thing altogether there. The salvation that comes with the knowledge of the truth, we put those together. That's the heartbeat of God. No more false teachers, no more false teaching, but a, a desire to see that the knowledge of the truth is put front and center under the salvation, with, I say with, merging it in, with the salvation that's available through Christ Jesus our Lord. That's the desire of God. We need another great awakening in this nation. We've seen it before. I say we. Um, not in my lifetime have I seen a great awakening, but, but this nation has seen various uh, awakenings. We need that again. We need revival in the church. I think that will precipitate a great spiritual awakening throughout this nation. And I don't think a great awakening will happen without revival happening first in the church. We need both. But let's start with us. Greg Glory, who is a, a pastor and evangelist, you might know him, know him to some degree from his Harvest Crusades. He's out of Southern California, uh, preaching to you know, arenas and even um, open air places filled with just tens of thousands of people. He was uh, featured in a recent movie called Jesus Revolution. And some of you saw that movie. Uh, I highly recommend that as well. But uh, he kind of summarizes some of these great awakenings we've seen, and I'll use some of his words here. 
uh, talking the first Great Awakening in the 1700s, 1740s in particular, led by men such as Jonathan Edwards and George Whitfield, when around 50,000 people were added to the churches of New England uh, during that first Great Awakening. Uh, and you're talking 50,000 people added to the churches in a population at that time of about 300,000. That is a significant portion of the population coming to faith in Jesus. The Second Great Awakening from the 1790s, roughly, to uh, the early half of the 1800s uh, was led by many different uh, preachers and teachers, including Charles Finney. Uh, this was during the days of the Wild West, when camp meetings were held in tents with sawdust floors, itinerant preachers you know, riding on horseback, going town to town, sharing the gospel, and thousands and thousands of Americans came to faith at that time. The third great awakening in our nation was seen in the 1800s, 1857 in particular is when that began, uh, which had somewhat of a unique start. There was a 48-year-old businessman named Jeremiah Lamphere who began with a burden to pray, and in New York City uh, set up a time for people to come and pray for just one hour a day. I think he started it weekly, if I remember that right. Uh, he's going to just start weekly prayer meetings in New York City. Um, and it started out really slow. Like, I mean, just a handful of people came to the first prayer meeting. But it started growing. And before long, there were tens of thousands, I'll say about 10,000, I should say that. About 10,000 people were praying regularly every week for God to do something in their city and in their nation. It exploded actually after the stock market crashed and um, and people weren't just gathering weekly, but they started gathering daily to pray. And during this time, there were about one million people who became believers in Jesus Christ out of a population at that day of about 30 million. It was through this movement uh, that the missionary advance of the gospel started spreading to go to other fields, foreign lands, even in Great Britain and Ireland, the reports of a Great Awakening was happening there with another million people coming to faith in Christ. Doors were opening for the gospel, the kingdom was advancing, and God was being glorified. And it all started in prayer. Every great work of God has first been carried out by God's people getting on their knees, getting serious about the faith, serious about their need to reach their neighbors with the gospel. And you can trace every one of these awakenings to people on their knees in prayer. Greg Laurie talks about, uh, he calls it a fourth great awakening. Others probably wouldn't put it in that category, but either way, it doesn't matter. In the 1970s, when the Jesus movement uh, took shape, and there were thousands upon thousands of people who got saved during that time as well. And Greg Glory got himself in the middle of a full-blown spiritual awakening, as he calls it. And that's our kind of focus of that Jesus Revolution movie. We need to be about business of praying for God to do something. For God to move in the hearts of people, to revive the church, and to awaken lost souls to the truth and the beauty of the gospel that they would turn and be saved. Because when we're praying for the salvation of souls, we are praying in line with God's will. This is his desire. He desires all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. He desires it so much that he gave his only begotten son on the cross, shedding his blood for the forgiveness of our sins, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's how much God desires the salvation of souls. That's how much he loves you. That's how much he wants to save you from the penalty of not receiving him. And that penalty is death. The wages of sin is death. That's what we deserve. I deserve it. You deserve it. We deserve everlasting death. Eternity in hell. Separated forever. Apart from the goodness of God. But his desire is that you would not experience that. And he has made a way for you to be saved through his son, Jesus Christ. Yes, there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man, 
Jesus Christ, who gave himself as a ransom for all. The word ransom there means a, a price of freedom. He saved us from our, our enslavement to sin. We were held captive in sin. We were dead, spiritually speaking. He has freed us and he has made us alive, free to serve God. Listen, if you're a child of God, sin no longer has dominion over you. You are no longer enslaved to sin. But you've been free. Now, we read all this and we preach this, proclaim it, give truth. Some people would say, well, isn't that being a little bit narrow-minded? There's a lot of religions out there. There are a lot of people who are very sincere in their faith, following different kinds of gods and different kinds of religions. How arrogant for you to claim that there is just one God and one way to be saved. Well, here's how I would answer that. Well, praise God that there is a way at all. There is only one way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Listen, we don't deserve it. We could never earn it. But he has made a way possible for us. There he is. There's, the, there's Jesus in the fullness of his glory, full of grace and truth. There is Christ living as a perfect, sinless Lamb of God. There is Jesus shedding his precious blood on the tree of Calvary so that we might be forgiven, cleansed, made new, made right with God. He has ransomed us. He has redeemed us. He has purchased my freedom. He has saved me from sin and death and hell and set me free and given me new, abundant, and eternal life. All because of his grace, not because of anything that I have done. So let's do this. Let's take our gospel preaching and faith teaching mission seriously. This is what Paul says. I was appointed for this. A preacher, apostle, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. Paul knew from the very beginning of this letter, he mentioned it several times, I'm an apostle of Christ by the command of God our Savior. I've been entrusted, verse 11, with this gospel of the glory of the blessed God. And the Lord has judged me faithful. He's appointed me to his service, verse 12. Uh, and here again, we see him saying the very, very same thing. I'm appointed for this purpose. It's his job. That's his work, his labor. For if you have no less of a calling in Christ Jesus, appointed to be a servant of the Lord, a missionary for the gospel, a preacher of the truth, a teacher of the faith. We need to take that work seriously. Don't wait for somebody else to do it. Now, not everybody can stand in the pulpit and lead as a pastor. I get that. But you are no less an ambassador of Christ Jesus than I. You are a witness for the glory of the gospel of God. It's the good news message. Maybe you don't feel qualified for that, but I've said this before. I'll keep saying it. If you know enough to know that you have been saved, that you know enough to tell somebody else how they can be saved. And there are people living in hopelessness and despair and frustration with life, chasing after the wind and coming up empty, worn out in the process. But you've got an opportunity to speak hope into their lives, to speak the message of Jesus Christ that can set them free, save their souls, and lead them to eternity. So I'll close by saying, so what keeps us from praying? If we know that we're called to pray, why don't we pray? Why don't we pray more? If we're called to proclaim the good news of the gospel, why aren't we doing that? If you were to sit down today as, as an employee in the office of Christ the King, and he were to do a performance review over the way that you are living your Christian faith, specifically in the areas of prayer and proclamation of the word, what would that evaluation look like? I've got, I've got to take some lashes myself, you know, before I try to tell you anything. But isn't that what he wants from us? Isn't that the job he's given us to do? Why aren't we doing it to the degree, the level, the intensity, the faithfulness, with the passion that he desires from us? Let's quit making excuses. Let's repent from our indifference and our callousness and our inactivity. 
Let's stop quenching the flame of the Holy Spirit and let's let the fire of God burn within us to do the work, the labor that he has called us to do for the salvation of souls, for the glory of God. Let me encourage you to pray, to pray more, to pray in faith, and to pray big. Challenge God, so to speak. See what God can do. Don't you know that he is able to do exceedingly and abundantly more than you can even begin to ask, think, or imagine? He can. Nothing is impossible for him. So don't give up. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Father, today I pray for the salvation of souls. And I pray that you would do a work that only you can do. Oh God, would you revive your church first and foremost. Where we have failed, Lord, I pray that we will fail no more. But that we will find a new passion, a new fire burning within us that seeks that souls would come to know Jesus before it's too late. Lord, I pray that we will be unashamed of the gospel, that we will preach it, teach it in love and compassion for those who are lost, but seeking with all that is within us to lead people to the truth of Jesus Christ. Lord, let us not grow weary in that fight. Let us not lose heart, but press on in faith and in Full dependence upon your power, your spirit, your word working in us and through us. That like Paul, we might be able to say at the end of our lives, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Even as we look forward to that reward that lies in it. Father, today, if there is even one person in this room or watching online who has never yet turned from their sin and in faith to Jesus Christ, and all that he's accomplished on the cross and by the power of his resurrection, that today, even at this moment, would be the day that they turn to you and trust you for everlasting life. And maybe just in a prayer like this, from the depth of their heart, they cry out to you for mercy, saying, oh God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I know I have failed. I have lived my own way, and I have not followed your, your commands. But Lord, today I am trusting in Jesus, and I'm receiving by faith this gift of your grace, the gift of everlasting life, and I want to follow you with my whole heart. So Jesus, be the Savior of my life, be the Lord of my life, I'm trusting you, fully surrendered, all in. God, thank you for the work that you do in the lives of those who pray and give their lives, surrender to your will. God, take us and use us as you see fit. Make us usable for your purposes, O oh God. Forgive us our sins. Cleanse us. Make us new. Make us whole. Create in us a clean heart, O oh God. Renew a right spirit within us so that we might be the ambassadors and witnesses you've called us to be in this world that so desperately needs to see the light of Christ. Praise you for that. Pray for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing our song of invitation, calling us to turn our eyes upon Jesus. I will be down at the front. You need to make a faith commitment today in any way. If you prayed that prayer of salvation and are ready to go public with that, I'd be more than thrilled to welcome you, to talk with you, and to praise the Lord together. With you. Let's stand together, Jesus.
morning. It's been good to be together, brethren and sistren, to worship. And if you're available at 1.30 this afternoon, we'll be out at Sunny Acres Nursing Home, and we'd love to see you up there. Anything else before we just... All right, may the Lord bless you.